Welcome everyone to Bookachino Live for October. It's Wednesday, October 12th. I don't know where October is going. It's just flying away as far as I'm concerned. And we have so much to do this month. Um, looking forward to sharing you a really terrific lineup of books. So let's get started. First, your top picks from September's presentation. As we say, this is always fun to see. Um, Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout was number one. Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ning was number two. Mad Honey by Jody Pico and Jennifer Finney Boylan, which I finished last night, is number three. Such an interesting book. Secluded Cabin Sleep Six, Lisa Unger, one of my best future bets on selections, is the fourth. Frederick Bachman, The Winners, is fifth. Matchmaker's Gift with Linda Cohen Leugman is number um, five. Let's see, I think we're doing five, six this time, five. Um, also, we have an interview with Linda Cohen Leugman that you may want to listen to about how she came up with the idea for this book. It's really, really crazy to hear what happened and um, how she started formulating the story. And then Lessons from Ian McEwen is number six. We did six this time simply because a lot of them were just too close together to be able to pick. Is it two, four, six? Maybe it's seven, two, four, six, seven. Can't count, seven from September's presentation. They were all like too tight to count. It's a big time of year for um, big books publishing. So let's see what else we've got for you. Oh, we had a survey question. We asked, do you like to watch or listen to author interviews? 75% enjoy watching author interviews on YouTube. 52% said they enjoy listening to author interviews on podcasts. 12% have not listened to author interviews on podcasts, but would like to try it. If you want to try that, we've got um, anywhere you look at, listen to podcasts, it's Book Reporter Talks to. And the same thing, the Book Report Network is our channel on YouTube. We have over 3,000 subscribers right now, which we're really super excited about. We've got 4% who do not like listening to author um, interviews on podcasts and 2% that don't like watching videos. So that's the results from last time. We've got a new question up for you this time. The, um, the question is just give us a little more insight into the group that we're speaking to during this uh, these weekday events. We're going to start out with fiction this time. Okay, we're going to go to one of what was one of my favorite books so far this year. Um, it is called Never Meant to Meet You by Ali Frank and Asha Humans. I met these two a couple of years ago when I was at the um, ALA, the American Library Association convention in Philadelphia. I had just come from Winter Institute. I swore I wasn't picking up any more books, no more books. I was just going to go in, have a couple of meetings, see a couple of people. And I went to a panel that they were on. And I don't even remember who I was supposed to see on that panel. It wasn't to meet them at all. And we started chatting about their book. And they gave the best um, little riff about what their book was about. And I walked up and I said, OK, give me a galley. And they gave me literally what was their last one. So you talk about it was meant to be for me to meet them at that point. That book was called Tiny Imperfections. Came out May 2020, a time when nobody was out with libraries, they, nobody was doing events, blah, blah, blah. Follow-up book is Never Meant to Meet You. And it is so much fun because it's the book that I told Roach about in the newsletter a couple weeks ago. I was laughing as I was reading because what you're not just seeing is the dialogue on the page. You're seeing the inner monologue that's going on in Marjette's head. And when you see what she's thinking in each situation, it's just rip-roaring funny. So Margette Lewis is the self-appointed fixer of everybody's woes. She's uncharacteristically determined to keep to her side of the driveway when it comes to her flawless neighbor, Noah Adams, uh, Abrams. Abrams. Professionally, Margette has her hands full. She prepares for a new class of kindergartners and her first year of teaching without her best friend, Judy, as the campus black up, the only two black women at the school. And... At home, her son's bedding, budding manhood challenges her expectations, and her vexing ex-husband continues to be a thorn in her side. But when tragedy strikes on Margette Street, an unexpected child shows up on her first day of school with an uncle who has all the class moms a flutter. Margette is forced to contend with both her neighbor and her own heartache over losing the life she once thought she was guaranteed. So there we've got never meant to meet you. And I will just tell you that one of the scenes at the beginning is her neighbor's husband has passed away. So she's going to go to Shiva and she walks in and she can't figure out why the beautiful mirrors are covered. And she starts pulling down the black blankets. And of course, that's something that traditionally you do during Shiva. And she also is walking in with fried chicken. It just goes from there. And it is just Roy's, Roy'sly funny. Next, we've got Ruin, a novel of fly fishing and bankruptcy by Lee Seipel. It is on sale now. Frank is another dreamer whose life is suddenly burned to the ground. 
More a disillusioned literature PhD than an experienced financier, he's naively agreed to join his wife Francie's inheritance with his own personal guarantee of a college friend's private equity partnership debt. The business implosion and subsequent bankruptcy took all their assets. So they flee Manhattan to live in a desolate, non-working Hudson, Hudson Valley farm. Um, they flee in their very, very, very low to the ground car, their Lamborghini, because it's the only asset they still have. So just picture driving the Lamborghini into the woods, and that's what we've got going on. Frank starts an artisanal break, um, brewery with a charismatic, new eccentric friend. And central to the heart of the story, he takes up fly fishing. A local doctor perceiving Frank's depression describes that he gains some confidence through self-taught fishing. Frank's perceptions on the water are fresh and ac acute, sometimes colored by his memory of words of famous writers, now painfully ironic in his new life's new context. The novel weaves together fly fishing and life experiences that ultimately turn shockingly deadly. We've got ruin. Next, we've got The Oracle of Maricor by Jeffrey McGuire. This is on sale this week. The Oracle of Maricor is a new installment in Je Gregory McGuire's Another Day trilogy, continuing the story of Elphaba's green-skinned granddaughter, Rain. Maricor, across the ocean from Oz, is beset by an invading army. In the mayhem, Rain and Kasi, a child felon, break out of prison. Chaos thunders upon them in the form of warriors, refugees, and, br and brigands. The very fabric of reality loosens, liberating creatures of myth and legend. Hewed in by secrets known only to the most highly placed members of the royal court, Rain and her companions hunt the filed, a fabled oracle of Maricor for guidance and soothsaying. His reclusive oracle should spin a prophecy. Might the desperate wicked years promise another day, one less perilous? So you know him as the author of Wicked. The Christmas Spirit by Debbie Maycumber coming on October 18th. Peter Armstrong and Hank Colfax are best friends, but their lives couldn't be more different. Peter, the local pastor, is dedicated to his community, spending time visiting the flock, attending meetings, and with the holy season approaching, preparing for the Christmas service and live nativity. As a bartender, Hank serves a much different customer base at his own family elm tavern, including a handful of lonely regulars and the local biker gang. When Peter scoffs that Hank has it easy compared to him, the two decide to switch jobs until Christmas Eve. And to their surprise, responsibilities of a bartender and a pastor are similar. Taking on each other's work is more difficult than either Peter or Hank expected. As the two begin to see each other in a new light and each discovers a new love to cherish, their lives are forever changed. I think that's really true. Let's look, what could be more the same, honestly, is the pastor and the bartender. We've got Demon Copperhead coming from Barbara Kingsolver next week. Set in the mountains of Southern Appalachia, D Demon Copperhead, inspired by Charles Dickens' David Copperfield, is the story of a boy born to a single teen mother in a single wide trailer with no access, assets beside, beyond his dead father's good looks and copper colored hair, a caustic wit, and a fierce talent for survival. In a plot that never pauses for breath, he braves the modern perils of foster care, child labor, derelict schools, athletic success, addiction, disastrous loves, and crushing losses. Through it all, he reckons with his own invisibility in a mod popular culture where even the superheroes have abandoned rural people in favor of cities. Next, we've got The Last Chairlift by John Irving, which is also on sale next week. And I think you might've seen in the newsletters, tomorrow night, Simon & Schuster is doing a chat where John Irving um, is going to be interviewed by his editor, uh, Jonathan Karp. And Jonathan Karp is wild about this book. He's been Irving's editor for a while. This is his, um, Irving's first book in seven years. I started reading the book last night. Let me just show you. This is how thick the book is. It's 400, I think, um, I think it's like 483 pages. And I picked it up and I was just going to read a couple of pages last night. And I started to really get into it. First of all, as many of our readers know, I love to ski. I met my husband when we were skiing. I had a long life of spending time at ski resorts. So immediately that drew me in. And then from there, it's really Irving's style of writing as I get into the story. And I'm going to see where it takes it from there. My husband is reading a galley of this. Um, he was going to, we went on a business trip a couple of weeks ago, but he didn't take it with him. He thought that would be the weight of his luggage. But uh, as we're both reading the book right now, it's really, really interesting. So what's going on in it? 
In Aspen, Colorado, 1941, Rachel Brewster is a slalom skier at the National Downhill and Slalom Championships. Little Ray, as she is called, finishes nowhere near the podium, but she manages to get pregnant. Back home in New England, Little Ray becomes a ski instructor. Her son, Adam, grows up in the family that devised conventions and evades questions concerning the eventful past. Years later, looking for answers, Adam will go to Aspen to the Hotel Jerome where he was conceived. And there Adam will meet some ghosts and they won't be the first or the last ghosts that he sees. So here we go, latest from John Irving. Next, we've got Liberation Day. We've got stories that are coming from George Saunders, also on October 18th. George is back with his first collection of short stories since 10th of December. Here he explores ideas of power, ethics, and justice, and cuts to the very heart of what it means to uh, live in community with our fellow humans. Love Letter is a tender missive from a grandfather to a grandson in the midst of a dystopian political situation in the not too distant, all too believable future that reminds us of our obligations to our ideals, ourselves, and one another. In Mother's Day, Two women who love the same man come to an ex existential reckoning in the middle of a hailstorm. And my house comes to terms with the haunting nature of unfulfilled dreams and the inevitability of decay. So there we've got Liberation Day. Next, we've got Signal Fires from Danny Shapiro, also out next week. It opens on a summer night in 1985. Three teenagers have been drinking when one of them gets behind the wheel of a car and in an instant, everything on Division Street changes each of their lives, and that of Ben Wilf, the dun young doctor who arrives on the scene, is shattered. For the Wilf family, the circumstances of that fatal accident will become a dangerous secret, never to be spoken. On Division Street, time has moved on. When the Shankmans arrive, it's as if the accident never happened. But when Waldo, the Shankman's brilliant, lonely son, who marvels at the beauty of the world and has a native ability to find connections in everything, befriends a now-retired Dr. Wilf, Past events come hurtling back in ways that no one could have foreseen. Next, we've got The Passenger coming from Cormac McCarthy on October 25th, 1980, past Christian, Mississippi. It's three in the morning when Bobby Western zips the jacket of his wetsuit, plunges from the Coast Guard tender into darkness. His dive light illuminates the sunken jet, nine bodies still buckled into their seats, hair floating, eyes devoid of speculation. From missing from the crash site are the pilot's flight bag, the pilot, the plane's black box, and the tenth passenger. But how? Collateral witness to the machinations that can only bring him harm, Western is shadowed in body and spirit by men with badges, by the ghost of his father, inventor of the bomb that melted glass and flesh in Hiroshima, and by his sister, the love and ruin of his soul. And now this is the first part of the story. Look for Stella Maris, the second installment in the two volume passenger series on sale December 6th. And we'll have a little bit on that later on in this presentation. Next, we've got Someday, Maybe by Oni. Let me see if I can do this. No, no, I just did it before. Nwabinelli. Okay, it's on sale on November 1st. Someday Maybe is a debut novel about a young woman's emotional journey through unimaginable loss, pulled along by her tight-knit Nigerian family, a posse of friends, and the love and laughter she shared with her husband. Here are some of the things you should know about my husband. One, he was the greatest love of my life, despite his pension for going incommunicado. He was, as far as I and everyone else could tell, perfectly happy, which is significant because... Number three, on New Year's Eve, he killed himself. And here's one thing you should know about me. I found him. Oh, and the bonus fact, no, I'm not okay. So I guess it will be that someday maybe is when she'll be okay, but she's not okay now. Next, we've got We Are the Light by Matthew Quick. And I heard him speaking about this. Um, you'll know him as the author of the Silver Linings Playbook. It's coming on November 1st. Lucas Goodgame lives in Majestic, Pennsylvania, a quaint suburb that's been torn apart by a recent tragedy. Everyone in Majestic sees Lucas as a hero. Everyone, that is, except Lucas himself. Insisting that his deceased wife, Darcy, visits him every night in the form of an angel, Lucas spends his time writing letters to his former Jungian as an analyst, Carl. It's only when Eli, the, an 18-year-old young man whom the community has ostracized, begins camping out in Lucas's backyard that an unlikely allowance takes, alliance takes shape and the true embark on a journey 
to heal their neighbors and most importantly, themselves. So there's, we are the light. And I know the publisher is very excited about this book. I'm hoping to read it and see if it would be good for me to be interviewing Matthew. Um, now I've got historical fiction. We've got Eyes Turned Skyward by Elena Dillon. It's coming on October 18th. Kathy Bagley is an empty nester, the primary caretaker of her ailing mother and the emotional support for her laid off husband. She's also returning to the office after two decades to work under a borderline inappropriate boss. Then Congressman Gold Medal Ceremony invitation arrives and she uncovers an unfathomable family secret. Her mother, Peggy Mayfield, wasn't just a tempestuous uh, wife and mother. She is, was a woman Air Force Service pilot. Once a spucky fire, Peggy is now filled with regret and she confronts the end of her life. But Kathy is determined to make her last months count by securing Peggy overdue, long overdue recognition, appreciating her anew and forgiving her before it's too late. There's that eyes turned skyward. A Gilded Mountain by Kate Manning coming November 1st. Sylvie Pelletier recounts leaving her family's snowbound mountain cabin to work in a manor house for the Pagets owner of the marble mining company that employs her father and dominates the town. Sharp-eyed Sylvie is awed by the luxury around her and confused by the erratic affectations of Jasper, the bookish heir to the family fortune. Her fairy tale ideals of romance take a dark turn when she realizes Paget's lofty philosophical talk is all at odds with the unfair labor, pra labor practices that have enriched them. Outside the manor walls, the town of Moonstone is roiling with discontent. The editor of the local newspaper, a bold woman who takes Sylvie on as an apprentice, is publishing unflattering accounts of the Paget Company. Sylvie navigates vastly different worlds and struggles to find her way amid conflicting loyalties. And when the harsh winter brings tragedy, she must choose between silence and revenge. So we've got Gilded Mountain. We've got some thrillers and mysteries. Opening up with David Boldacci, whose book Long Shadows is a memory man thriller on sale this week. When Amos De Decker is called to South Florida to investigate a double homicide, the case appears straightforward. Federal judge and her bodyguard have been found dead. The judge's face sporting a blindfold with two eye holes cruelly cut out, clear sign that she made one too many enemies over her years on the bench. What at first seems cut and dry is anything but. Meanwhile, Decker must contend with a series of unsettling changes, including a new partner, Special Agent Frederica Freddie White and a devastating event that brings Decker's own tragic past back to the present and forces him to reckon with his future. As potential witnesses start disappearing, Decker and White are inexorably pulled um, down a twisted funnel of secrets, crimes, and scandal, at the end of which lies Decker's deadliest threat yet. There's long shadows. And from Nelson DeMille, We've got The Maze, his latest John Corey novel, which is on sale this week. This must much uh, long been awaited. It was actually supposed to come out in the spring and it moved to this timing. Um, we've got John Corey in his total irreverent self. And those who have read um, the bill before know exactly what I'm talking about with John Corey. He is just like, a, he's a guy's guy. Let's just put it that way. He's forced into retirement from his last job as a federal agent with the diplomatic su surveillance group. He's restless and he's looking for action. So when his former lover, Detective Beth Penrose, appears with a job offer, Corey must once again make decisions about his career and about reuniting with Beth. Inspired by and based on the still unsolved Gilgo Beach murders, the maze takes readers on a dangerous hunt for an apparent serial killer who has murdered nine and maybe more prostitutes and hidden their bodies in the thick undergrowth on a lonely stretch of beast. As Corey digs deeper into the case, which made national news, he comes to suspect that the failure of the local police to solve this sensational crime may not be the result of their inexperience and competence. It may be something else, something more sinister. And Nelson has announced that this is going to be his last John Corey book. Um, so if you want to like see what he's up to now, this is the moment to jump on this one. I think the cover is really cool looking too. Boys from Biloxi by John Grisham, coming on October 18th. For most of the last hundred years, Biloxi was known for its beaches, resorts, and seafood industry, but it had a darker side. It was notorious for corruption and vice, everything from gambling, prostitution, bootleg liquor, and drugs to contract killing. The vice was controlled by a small cabal of mobsters, many of them rumored to be members of the Dixie Mafia. 
Keith Ruddy and Hugh Malco grew up in Biloxi in the 60s and were childhood friends, as well as Little League All-Stars. But as teenagers, their lives took them in different directions. Keith's father became a legendary pop prosecutor determined to clean up the coast. Hugh's father became the boss of Biloxi's criminal underground. Keith went to law school and followed his father's footsteps. Hugh preferred the nightlife and worked in his father's clubs. The two families were herded for a showdown, one that will happen, happen in a courtroom. There we've got the boys from Biloxi. If you're wondering why so many books are out this week and next week, the reason is um, at this time of year, uh, booksellers, uh, stores want to be sure that they have lots of stock for the holiday. And this is a time to start stocking up. When things get busy in bookstores around the middle of November, before the holidays, um, less and less is shipped, believe it or not, because everything needs to be in store, stacked and ready to go. And a number of booksellers have even said they find it hard to open boxes in December. So you'll see, like as time goes on, usually there's somewhere around a, a mid-October to November cutoff date for making sure books are going to be in the stores. And this year, when every store is really paring um, down on what they're getting to be sure what they'll actually sell, we're going to go with that same thing we said last year is to shop early. If you're shopping for books, shopping for anything, this is the year to do this early because um, coming close to the, the holiday, things may not be able to ship supply chain, supply chain, the word we didn't know in 2020, and boy, now do we know those two words together, um, is going to be an issue. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your Hollywood um, holiday shopping, Hollywood shopping too. Next, we've got um, Poster Girl from Veronica Roth. It's her second book for adults. It's on sale on October 18th. Um, what's right is right. Sonia Cantor knows this slogan. She's lived by it for most of her life. For decades, everyone in the Seattle, Portland megalopolis has lived under it, as well as constant surveillance in the form of the insight, an ocular implant that tracks every word and every action, rewarding or punishing by a rigid, rigid moral code set forth by the delegation. Then there was a revolution. The delegation fell. Its most malleable members were locked in the aperture, a prison on the outskirts of the city, and everyone else, now free from the insights monitoring, went on with their lives. Sonia, a former poster girl for the delegation, has been in prison for 10 years when an old enemy comes to her with a deal. Find a missing girl who was stolen from her parents by the old regime and earn her freedom. There's that poster girl, very cool cover. Next, we've got Wanda Morris's Anywhere You Run, Your Past Will Find You. This is one of our fall preview selections. It's coming on October 25th. The summer of 1964, three innocent men are brutally murdered trying to help Black Mississippians secure the right to vote. Against this backdrop, 21-year-old Violet Richards finds herself in more trouble than she's ever been in her life. Suffering a brutal attack of her own, she kills the man responsible. With the color of Violet's skin, there's no way she can escape Jim Crow justice in Jackson, Mississippi. With the help of her white beau, she escapes. Back in Jackson, Violet's older sister Marigold has dreams of attending law school, but she's pregnant and unmarried. After news of the murder brings the police to her door, Marigold heads north, seeking the promise of a better life and no more segregation. But as she made a terrible choice that threatens her life and that of her unborn child. And there you've got Anywhere You Run. Now from Jack Reacher and Andrew Child. Andrew Child is his brother, who's actually going to take the name Andrew Reacher, unless we changed our mind about that. They're writing together. Um, it's called No Plan B. And it's Lee Child and No Plan B. Lee Child, No Plan B. <laughs> it's like Lee Child, No Plan B is the name, No Plan B is the name of the book. Um, it is in Geraldsville, Colorado. A woman dies under the wheels of a moving bus. Death is ruled a suicide, but Jack Reacher saw what really happened. A man in a gray hoodie and jeans moving stealthily pushed the victim to her demise before swiftly grabbing the dead woman's purse and strolling away. When another homicide is ruled an accident, Reacher knows this is no consequence. coincidence. With a killer on the loose, Reacher has no time to waste to track down those responsible. But Reacher is unaware that these crimes are part of something much larger and more far-reaching, an arsonist out for revenge, a foster kid on the run, and a cabal of powerful people involved in a secret conspiracy with many moving parts. 
I also saw that um, some uh, filming was being done in Andrew's home and um, Lee and Andrew were both there, which leads me to believe it's either going to be a morning show or something where they were looking for B-roll or um, interviewing them in their, um, where they live. They both live on ranches in Wyoming right now, um, which is kind of interesting. I think they each have, I forget how many acres out there, but um, yes, they both are living out on ranches and are completely happy. So really different um, from Lee being in the city. Next, we've got Triple Cross and Alex Cross Thriller by James Patterson. Um, I included this one for a really interesting reason. I interviewed James Patterson this weekend at the Morristown Festival of Books. And before I did that, I read his autobiography, James Patterson by James Patterson. It was really interesting because he, the chapters were just in short, just as short there in his autobiography as they are in all the thrillers that he writes. But it's very poignant about how he writes what he does, the business of being James Patterson. And, you know, a lot of us sit there and say, oh, he just has a book a month, all these kinds of things. And you can have your, your own thoughts about his writing. But you have to realize that this was a guy that in 1999 walked into his publisher's office and said, I'd like to do three books next year. And that was at a time where unless you were writing romance, like paperbacks, nobody was writing like that. Nothing was happening like that. And they were going to be three very different books, three very different characters. So where he started a trend where many authors are writing more than one book a year now, writing in different genres, writing in different categories. Very, very interesting to hear. So this is Alex Cross, the, probably the um, books that he's most known for. Here, Alex is a hunting down a serial killer who targets entire families. Precise killer, he always moves under the cover of darkness, flawlessly triggering no alarms, leaving no physical evidence. Also investigating this most intriguing case is the world's best-selling true crime author, Thomas Cull, who sees patterns everywhere everyone else misses and calls the family man murders the perfect crime story. He believes the killer may never be caught. Cross knows there's no perfect crime and he's gonna hunt down the family man no matter what it takes until the family man decides to flip the narrative and bring, Cross, bring down Cross and his family. So really interesting. And it was even more interesting after I interviewed him to hear a lot more about how he was working with other people. Um, he actually basically comes up with an idea, gives the people an outline. Every single book he writes is very, very in-depth outlined of where the story is going to go. And we hear from a lot of um, authors that are pantsers, meaning they just do it by the seat of their pants. And to see somebody who are the, the um, outline is so um, intrinsic to what's gonna happen is interesting. And we also talked about how much he's reading these days. And he said, the one thing that sort of has taken a back seat because he's do, doing so much writing. And he also did share also that writing and his career is something that he considers is a joy to deal with. He doesn't consider it work. So very interesting from somebody who really writes a lot. Next, we've got The Couple at the Table by Sophie Hanna. It's coming on November 1st. Jane and William are enjoying their honeymoon at exclusive couples only resort until Jane receives a chilling note warning her to beware of the couple at the table nearest to yours. Dinner that night, five other couples are present. None of the tables is any nearer further than the other, uh, any of the others. It's almost as if someone has set the scene in order to make it warning note, meaningless. But why would anyone do that? Jane has no idea. But someone in this dining room will be dead before breakfast and all the evidence will suggest that no one there that night could possibly have committed the crime. So we'll see what happens at the couple at the table. From BA Paris, we've got The Prisoner coming on November 1st. Um, Emile, Emily, let's see, let me see if I can do this. Emily has been a survivor from losing her parents as a child in Paris to making it on her own in London. And she builds a life for herself. She's swept up into a glamorous lifestyle where she's married a handsome billionaire, Ned Hawthorne. You know what? Whenever you marry the, the, the handsome billionaire, just be careful. Something's going to happen. I know. If you thought marry the handsome billionaire, just be ready. Because then she wakes up in a pitch black room, not knowing where she is. Why has she been taken? Who are her mysterious captors? And why does she soon feel safer here imprisoned than she had begun to feel with her husband? See the billionaires? They get you every single time. So there we've got The Prisoner by B.A. Harris. Next, we've got memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction. Okay, this is Down and Out in Paradise, The Life of Anthony Bourdain. This is an unauthorized biography of Charles Learson, which is uh, just out this week. We have a review of it by Jesse Cornbluth, who found a book reporter with me that's running this week. It's a really interesting book because I was always a huge fan of Anthony Bourdain's life. And everything just seemed perfect. This guy gets on airplanes, he goes places, he meets people, he tries new foods, people gravitate towards him. 
So why did he die by suicide? And his death by suicide in June, um, 2018 shocked people around the world. He seemed to have it all, an irresistible personality, a dream job, a beautiful family, international fame. And the reality was more complicated than it seemed. His charisma belied a troubled spirit. Addiction and obsession with perfection and personal in integrity ruined two marriages and turned him into the boss from hell, even as millions became intrigued by the ever curious and genuinely empathetic traveler they saw on TV. Bourdain was already running out of steam physically and emotionally when he fell hard for an Italian actress who couldn't be more colder to him than sometimes he was to others and who effectively drove a wedge between him and his young daughter. Down and Out in Paradise is the first book to tell the true and full story of Anthony Bourdain relating the highs and lows of an extraordinary life. And it's interesting because I've been reading in bits and bites um, a book about Anthony Bourdain, which is told by a number of different people that were part of his life. And they talk about, you know, when he first started writing and what he loved about writing and what he liked about drinking and drugs and what he liked about his wife and what he loved about his daughter. And all these stories are woven together in just little paragraphs. So between this and this other book, we have two very different um, looks at him. And um, this also, this something of the family is coming out and saying, no, this isn't sanctioned his, his brother, but I believe his wife is somebody who contributed to the story. Um, next, we've got Somewhere Sisters, a story of adoption, identity, and the meaning of family from Erika Hayasaki, which is coming out from Algonquin Books this week. It's 1998 in Vietnam and Lien struggled to care for her newborn twin girls. Ha was taken by Yen's sister and she grew up in a rural village with her aunt. They had sporadic electricity and frequent monsoons. Ha's twin sister, Luan, was adopted by a wealthy white American family who renamed her Isabella. Isabella grew up in the suburbs of Chicago with a non-biological sister, Olivia, also adopted from Vietnam. Olivia and Isabella attended a predominantly white Catholic school, played soccer, and prepared for college. But while Isabella's adoptive mother learned of her biological twin back in Vietnam, all of their lives changed forever. Award-winning journalist Erica Hayasaki brings the girls' experiences to life on the page, told from their own perspectives, changing conceptions about adoption and what it means to give a girl a good life. So I think this is a really, really interesting um, book and one to um, want to be able to explore. That'd be a good book club chat book too. And then there was Light, Abraham Lincoln and the American Struggle is coming from John Meacham on October 18th. Uh, and then there was Light tells the story of Abraham Lincoln from his birth on the Kentucky frontier in 1809 to his leadership during the Civil War to his tragic assassination in 1865. His rise, his self-education, his loves, his bouts of depression, his political failures, his deepening faith, and his persistent conviction that slavery must end. In a nation shaped by courage of the enslaved of the era and by brave witness to Black Americans, Lincoln's story illustrates the ways and means of politics, democracy, the roots and durability of racism, and the capacity of conscience to shape um, events. So there we've got, and there was a light by John Meacham. Next, we've got The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man, a memoir, Paul Newman, edited by David Rosenthal. Now, everyone knows that um, Paul Newman's got amazingly beautiful blue eyes. I don't understand why this photo is in black and white. So it's coming on October 18th. In 1986, Paul Newman and his closest friend, screenwriter Stuart Stern, began an extraordinary project. Stuart was about to compile an oral history, have Newman's family, friends, and colleagues talk about the actor's life. The only stipulation was that anyone who spoke on the record had to be completely honest, including Newman himself. The result is an extraordinary, insightful, and revealing memoir, culled from thousands of pages of transcripts. Newman's voice is powerful, always meeting that of high standard of honesty. The additional voices from childhood friends and Navy buddies, from family members and film and theater collaborators such as Tom Cruise, George Roy Hill, Martin Ritt, and John Houston that run, through, um, run throughout add richness, color, and context to the story that Newman is telling. That's a good one for the holiday, giving. Next, we've got My Travels with Mrs. Kennedy by Clint Hill and Lisa McCobin um, Hill. Um, it's really interesting. Clint traveled with her for years, with Mrs. Kennedy for years. And I've read other, another book that he had written. It was just so well done of how much he was um, really in charge of making sure she was secure, but really a very big partner in Mrs. Kennedy's life. 
When he's prepared to sell his home in Alexandria, um, Virginia, retired Secret Save Service agent Clint Hill uncovers an old steamer trunk in the garage, triggering a floodgate of memories. As he and Lisa McCubbin, his co-author on the three previous books, pry it open for the first time in 50 years, they find forgotten photos, handwritten notes, personal gifts, and treasured mementos from the trips on which Hill accompanied the First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, as her Secret Service agent. Trips that took them from Paris to London through India, Pakistan, Greece, Morocco, Mexico, South America, and the Amalfi Coast. My Travels with Mrs. Kennedy unveils a personal side of history that's never been told before and takes the reader on a breathtaking journey, experiencing what it was like for Ken Hill, Clint Hill to travel with Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, the entire world was falling in love with her. And it's interesting because he was actually the guy that was um, on the motorcade when Kennedy was assassinated and he was assigned to Mrs. Kennedy. So there goes another behind the scenes. Now, you know what? Remember a couple of weeks I was going to throw out all the stuff, all the boxes that I found in the attic? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should hold them. I should put them in a trunk and the boys can find them someday. And they can sit there and write a book about their stories of what happened in their lives when they become very, very famous. I don't know. I still think I'm going to throw them out. I'm looking at them right now. The Revolutionary Samuel Adams by Stacey Schiff. It's coming on October 26th. Thomas Jefferson asserted that if there was any leader of the revolution, Samuel Adams was the man. John Adams thought his cousin was the most sagacious politician of all. With high-minded ideals and bare-knuckle tactics, Adams led what be called the greatest campaign of civil resistance in American history. Pulitzer Prize-winning biographer Stacey Schiff returns Adams to a seat of glory, introducing us to the shrewd and eloquent and intensely disciplined man who supplied the moral backbone of the American Revolution. So there you've got the latest about John Adams. What am I not doing this time? Hold on a second. Going for, oops, hold on a second. I touched the wrong. Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing, a memoir by Matthew Perry, coming on November 1st. Hi, my name is Matthew, and although you may know me by another name, my friends call me Maddie, and I should be dead. So begins the riveting story of the claimed actor, Matthew Perry, taking us along on his journey from childhood ambition to fame to addiction and recovery in the aftermath of a life-threatening health scare. Before the frequent hospital visits and stints in rehab, there was five-year-old Matthew who traveled from Montreal to LA, shuffling between his separated parents. 14-year-old Matthew, who traveled from Montreal to Los Angeles, uh, wait, I'm sorry, 14-year-old Matthew, who was a nationally ranked tennis star in Canada. 24-year-old Matthew, who nabbed a coveted role as a lead cast member on the talked about pilot then called Friends Like Us, and so much more. So there you've got Friends Lover, and the big terrible thing. Next, we've got some December titles to look forward to. Um, Jane Smiley is back with A Dangerous Business on December 6th. It's Monterey, 1851. Ever since her husband was killed in a bar fight, Eliza Ripple has been working in a brothel. It seems like a better life, at least at first. The madam, Mrs. Parks, is kind. The men are relatively well-behaved. And Eliza has attained what few women have, financial security. When the dead bodies of young women start appearing outside the town, a darkness descends that she can't resist confronting. Side by side with her friend Jean, and inspired by her reading, especially by a, inspired by Edgar Allan Poe's Detective Dupin, Eliza puzzles together an array of clues to try to find the killer, and while juggling clients who begin to seem more and more suspicious. Next, we've got Elizabeth Taylor, The Glit and Glamour of an Icon by Kate Anderson Brower is on sale December 6th. No celebrity rivals Elizabeth Taylor's glamour and guts or her level of fame. The first ever authorized biography of the Hollywood icon, Kate Anderson Brower reveals to the world through Elizabeth's eyes. Brower uses Elizabeth's unpublished letters, diary, entrees, and off the record interview transcripts, as well as interviews with 250 of her closest friends and families to tell the full unvarnished story of a remarkable career and explosive private life that made headlines worldwide. Elizabeth Taylor captures this um, intelligent, empathetic, tenacious, volatile, and complex woman as never before. Next, we've got A Private Spy, The Letters of Jean Le Carré, edited by Tim Cornwall on sale December 6th. Never before seen co correspondence of John Le Carré, one of the most important novelists of our generation, are collected in this beautiful volume. 
During his lifetime, Lecrae wrote, wrote numerous letters to writers, spies, politicians, artists, actors, and public figures. And this collection is a treasure trove, revealing the late author's humor, generosity, and wit, a side of him many readers have not previously seen. Now, what do we see here in this, this um, presentation so far today? We've seen about four or five books that are written on writings that people had, things that people had written, and where I'm going to talk about this again, which I've talked about in the past, where now these days is our shared history? Where is everything writing down? Are you saving text messages? Are you saving emails? Where is the handwriting written notes that are going to be the things that we're remembered by? Or are we going to be able to get back to my AOL from 1996 to learn really when the book report was supposed to be started? So it's just something to think about because there's so little that's written. I know I'm writing sympathy thank you notes right now, which are taking forever. And I realize how bad my handwriting is. But by the same token, I want people to have something that's written instead of just something that they're reading online that's fleeting. So just something to think about. Okay, we talked early about Stella Morris, the second Cormac McCarthy book coming on December 6th. It's the second volume of the Passenger series. It's 1972. Black Falls, Wisconsin, Black River Falls, Wisconsin, 20-year-old Alicia Western, who has $40,000 in a plastic bag, admits herself to hospital. A doctoral candidate in mathematics at the University of Chicago, she's been diagnosed with a paranoid schizophrenia, and she doesn't want to talk about her brother, Bobby. Instead, she contemplates the nature of madness, the human insistence on one common experience of the world. She recalls a childhood where by the age of seven, her own grandmother feared for her. She surveys the intersection of physics and philosophy, and she in introduces her cohorts, her chimeras, the hallucination that only she can see. All the while, she grieves for Bobby, not quite dead, not quite hers. So there we've got Stella Maris. And um, we've got Miss Demeanor by Eleanor Lippman coming on December 27th. Jane Morgan is a valued member of her law firm, or she was until a prudish neighbor, binoculars poised, observes her having sex on the roof of her New York City apartment building. Police are summoned, and a punishing judge sentenced her to six months of home confinement. With Jane now jobless and rootless, trapped at home, life looks bleak. Yes, her twin sister provides support and advice, but most of the unwelcome kind. When a doorman lets slip that Jane isn't the only resident wearing an ankle monitor, she strikes up a, a friendship, with a fellow white collar felon, Perry Salisbury. She tries to adapt to life within her apartment walls. She discovered that she hasn't heard the end of that tattletale neighbor, whose part wasn't as decorous, de as, decorous as her 911 snitching would suggest. So there we've got Ms. Demeanor. These are some notable paperback releases um, coming out this month. The Attic on Queen Street by Karen White, Her Hidden Genius by Marie Benedict, The Postmistress of Paris, which is um, now available uh, by Megway Clayton, Alex Trebek, and the answer is Honor by Freddie Umberger, The Collective by Allison Galen, The Vanishing Point by Elizabeth Brundage. There we've got two, four, six, seven books that uh, will make for good paperback reading this month. My bets on selections, this is what we have so far this year. I will be adding the um, Ali and Asha's book, and I'm actually gonna be interviewing them next week as well. This week was a little hectic. We closed on Monday, and boy, just not working one day one day different is a big deal, folks. Um, also, we've got our recent um, videos and podcasts. We've got The Real Mrs. Tobias, where I interview Sally Coslow. It's a ton of fun because Sally and I used to work at Madame Cell Magazine together, and we tell some magazine stories about magazines then and magazines now. And then we've got um, Linda Cohen uh, Wegman talking to me about The Matchmaker's Gift. Two really fun ones. Also, we've got our um, recent Bookachino Live book, um, book club event, book group event, uh, where we were speaking about the personal librarian with uh, Marie Benedict and Victoria uh, Christopher Murray. It was a huge success. It's the biggest crowd we've had in an event. And um, besides that, it's the, you know, in, in TV, they say it's um, like live plus seven, live, which means live plus seven days. We're posting really big numbers on um, people who are watching the video and the podcast later. So if you missed it, it's well worth taking a look. It's um, about an hour and a half long, so you might want to break it up into segments. I'm just saying that in advance, but they were terrific. And they also said that our audience brought them questions that they hadn't heard before, which was fantastic. 
Our next Bookachino Live book group event will be on Thursday, October 27th at eight o'clock. We're going to be talking to Joyce Maynard about Count the Ways. You've got time to read this book. It's a thick one, guys. Get started. And um, I'm really looking forward to talking to Joyce. I also might have talked to her about like you know, coming up on Thanksgiving about how you make pie crust because she's got this handy dandy way to do it that she says always works. Um, but she's really terrific. And we're looking forward to have another large group for this event. So if you want to um, sign up yourself, invite people from your book club, invite readers, tell your librarian, tell your booksellers about it. Feel free because we can accommodate, we come get a large crowd and we love to hear the conversation amongst you as well. Our next um, live Wilkachino live event, which will be our last one of 2022. I know it'll only be November, but we're not going to do one in December. And there's a reason why. Between November 8th and the end of the year, not a lot of books are published. And for all those reasons I told you before, people want to be in stock for the holidays. Um, it's just a really tough time to be like doing shipping and all these things. So we'll just do those books and we're going to do a peek ahead in January and February. Where we're already seeing some terrific titles that are coming out. So I'll be sharing those with you in advance. It's going to be on Wednesday, November 9th at two o'clock in the afternoon. Signups going to be available on Book Reporter later today. Also, anybody who's attending live, you'll receive a note from me after this. And I'll have that link in it for you to go sign up for that event. And also, if you want to sign up for the event that we're doing with Joyce as well. So that's going to be our last event of Bocaccino Live as an afternoon event. We're planning to do a, um, an evening event. Um, we're going to do another book club event in November. We got a couple of people in mind for that. And then in December, we're going to do what we did last year. We're hoping to do our reviewers come on to talk about their favorite books of the year. So we, while we're going to not have just one more Bocaccino Live programming, just know that we're um, definitely getting ready to do some evening programming as well so that more people can participate. Um, and then we'll be back again with this in January. So it'll be November in the afternoon, um, a November, October, November evening events, a December evening event. And then in January, we'll do something back again in the afternoon.